The church is full of hypocrites. How many of you guys have heard that before? How many of you have heard somebody say the church is full of hypocrites? Yeah, you don't have to be a Christian for very long before you're going to hear somebody accuse the church of being full of hypocrites. Gandhi famously said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. It's a very common objection to Christianity. In fact, so much so that Evangelism Explosion, which is an organization that does uh, evangelism, helps the church learn about evangelism, uh, evangelism they have done a, um, a survey where they, they collected and, and curated the top 10 objections that people have against Christianity. And a lot of them kind of run along apologetics lines, like I don't believe in a, in a God, or I don't believe in metaphysics, I don't, uh, contradictions in the Bible, evolution, denying miracles, or the virgin birth, or that kind of thing. But on that top 10 list is, well, the church is full of hypocrites, and that's why I object to Christianity. That's why I'm not a believer. In fact, the reason this morning that I'm preaching this sermon is a few weeks ago, a gentleman in this church came up to me and he said, hey, I would love it if you would speak on hypocrisy because I have someone that I love very much who has a real antenna for every time Christians are hypocrites in anything, he notices and brings it up, and it's just an issue, right? Because it comes up all the time. So before we really get into the message, let's talk about what is hypocrisy? What does it mean to be a hypocrite? It comes, uh, the, the word we use today, hypocrite, actually comes from a Greek word that was common in, um, in the first century uh, called, uh, the, the word is uh, hypocrites. Hypocrites, what it actually meant was an actor or someone who played a, a part on a stage. What's interesting is that in the first century, hypocrites wouldn't have been a, an insult or a pejorative. It would have just been, you're an actor. That's what the, the word for actor was. Um, and so to be a hypocrite is to be to pretend something that you're not. There was a 12-year-old boy who was going to his first orthodontist appointment. He was nervous and he wanted to impress a doctor. And so he had to fill out a, um, a patient form. And on it, it said, what are your hobbies? And the boy wrote, swimming and flossing. <laughs> right? Look, we get it because uh, we all have been in that situation before, right? Where we want to present ourselves in a certain way. We're all mindful of, of how people are perceiving us. We all want to be liked. We all want to be accepted. And so it's very normal for us to pretend or project something that is maybe not accurate with what's on the inside. In fact, nothing could be more human. Nothing could be no more normal. But while hypocrisy might be normal, the Bible teaches it is also very sinful, particularly when it comes to our faith. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. That on the outside, that what they say and what they project to other people is godliness, and yet on the inside, what's really going on in their heart is far away, as far away from that as possible. Jesus, more than any other figure in the Bible, talked about hypocrisy. It was a regular conversation of his because it was a besetting sin of his day. In the first century Judaism, hypocrisy was one of the primary sins. The reason being because they lived in a very hyper-religious culture. And there was a lot of cultural status and a lot of credit um, and clout to be gained by portraying yourself as being very godly. And yet the reality of their hearts was that their hearts were far from God. The sin of hypocrisy today oftentimes will take on two different forms among Christians. Um, I'm going to call them, the, the first form I'm going to call double-minded hypocrite or double-minded hypocrisy. This is people who claim to be Christians and yet their lives show almost no evidence of it. In fact, their lives would show the opposite. They embrace worldliness or gossiping or lying, cheating, smoking weed, looking at pornography, cussing. They play with sin. They treat it as no big deal and they don't see anything wrong with it. Paul said of, of these people in Titus 1, 16, he said, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Oftentimes, this is prevalent today in our culture, and one of the reasons is because for, the long time, for a long time, the church has practiced um, easy believism. Easy believism just kind of comes from the idea of the way that you become regenerate, the way you become a Christian is at a church service or at a big evangelistic meeting, you, you bow your head, you pray this prayer, you raise your hand, and you come forward and you take our pamphlet. And, and look, sometimes you'll see at our church, that's how we'll do an altar call like that. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that altar call. But then to say that that person is now a Christian is not necessarily accurate, right? Because if they go on and live their life and, and never think another thing about that, they're not a Christian. It doesn't mean that they had real saving faith. Now, some of us were actually saved that way. And we've gone on in our life to demonstrate saving faith, but, but sometimes people don't. And so what happens is, is, is some well-meaning Christian will say, well, you're a Christian. 
You know, you remember you when you gave your life to the Lord or something like that, and, and yet the person is, has not displayed any kind of evidence of real saving faith. And so what happens is the bar just kind of gradually gets lower and lower and lower until you get something like 75% of Americans uh, say that they're a believing Christian. Well, that, that's certainly, if you just, you just have to <laughs> just live in this country for five minutes to realize that that certainly isn't true. And so the first kind of double-minded Christian is the Christian who, who professes that they're a Christian, who says they're a Christian, and yet their life looks nothing like it. The second type, though, is almost the opposite. It's almost the inverse of the double-minded Christian. It's the self-righteous hypocrite. These are people who act godly on the outside, but on the inside, their motivations are self-seeking. Jesus said about these people in Matthew 23, 28, he said, in the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. These are people that Jesus was regularly dealing with because this would have been the, the, the primary sins of the Pharisees. They portraying righteousness on the, on the outside, but on the inside, their motivations are to gain clout or status. You know, oftentimes when, when people are um, self-righteous hypocrites, what it means is, is their, their motivations for acting good or for doing good things is to try to almost be better than other people. And, and the reality is, is that people, even though they might not be able to, to explain it or prove it, they know that your motivations are, are impure. And so they know sometimes that even though someone will, you know, give generously or will promote themselves or serve somebody or do something um, that would be righteous, they know that the reasons that that person's doing it are not godly and not good. So it brings us back to the question of our sermon this morning. Is the church really full of hypocrites? Is it true that the church is full of hypocrites? Well, hypocrisy indeed is a sin that we need to be on guard against, but oftentimes the person who's saying the church is full of hypocrites is doing so because they're either insincere, ignorant, or misinformed. I want to say this in, in this way. D. James Kennedy, who um, was a, a famous pastor, a famous evangelist, he used to have a famous line where when people would say, well, the church is full of hypocrites, he'd, he'd always say, well, there's, there's always room for one more right? He had, he, had a similar saying, he had a similar saying that is, if you ever find a, ch- a perfect church, don't go there because you'll just end up messing it up, right? And, and the thing that he's pointing at is that hypocrisy is not necessarily a Christian problem. Hypocrisy is a human problem, right? And all of us know that it's, it's possible for us, and often, sometimes we do, fall into hypocrisy, and all of us know, uh, sometimes what he's pointing at is that sometimes we want to use a different standard for other people than we want to use for ourselves. And so sometimes when people are saying, well, the church is always full of hip- hip- hypocrites, what they're saying is that, that somehow they are worse than me and I don't want to be a, a part of them. Um, sometimes what the problem is, is a problem of definitions. Sometimes that people will use the word hypocrite and sinner as if they're the same thing, and, and they're simply not, right? So it, you could say something like, you know, all murderers are sinners, but therefore not all sinners are murderers, right? Because uh, uh, murder is a specific kind of sin, and while hypocrisy is a certain kind of sin, it doesn't mean that all sinners are hypocrites. You know, as Christians, we sin, and we, we sin daily, right? In, in the, the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us our day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, right? It almost implying that the sin that we commit is is regular and is consistent. So we have set out as our standard that we want to be like Jesus. But in the same breath, all of us would want to confess, but we fall short of that, right? We sin in ways and regularly on a daily basis. Because we sin, that doesn't make us hypocrites. In fact, the, the Christian church is probably the only organization in the world that requires you to be a sinner to be a member, Okay? So just to get in the door, you have to say, yes, I'm a sinner. And so people sometimes they'll say, well, I saw a Christian doing this, that, or the other thing. That doesn't mean necessarily they're a hypocrite. It just means that that they're a sinner and and that all of us would say that we are. And so sometimes there's a misunderstanding or miscommunication about what it means to be a Christian. Oftentimes, though, the, the claim that the church is full of hypocrites comes from someone as in a defensive posture or as a defense mechanism. Oftentimes, it's, it's part of a conversation. We're talking about faith or Christianity or belief. You'll come with a, a family member or someone that you're close to, and you'll, you, they'll, they'll say as an objection to almost kind of turn the tables, well, that's because the church is full of hypocrites. Oftentimes, it's not a sincere claim, though. 
oftentimes people are trying to hide their own guilt because the reality is if, if the world really is created by God, if we're not here just on accident, happenstance, that there really is a God, and not only was the world created, but you were created by God in his image, and that that God, you sinned against him, and that that God also sent his son to the earth to die on the cross, this is just the basic tenets of Christianity, if that is true, then it requires something from every single person who lives. It requires, we owe him our allegiance. We owe him to come under his authority. That would be the only right response to the reality of God. And so oftentimes people who are, don't want to bring themselves under his authority will come up with all kinds of reasons and all kinds of defenses and all kinds of rationalizations on why they don't want to. And that's how you get things where somebody would say, I like your Jesus, but I don't like you Christians. You're so unlike your Savior. What you'll find oftentimes, if you, if you push on there very hard, oftentimes it's just very thin. Okay? It's, it's just a, a very shallow excuse that people will use. Oftentimes what you'll find is actually when they say, I like your Jesus, they don't actually know very much about Jesus at all. What they do know about Jesus is just, just some carefully curated little parts of his personality they want to uh, accept because it aligns with their preferences and the things that they like. But in reality, it doesn't represent who Jesus is in the Bible. And it doesn't, they don't know what it is that Jesus requires of his followers and other, other believers. And so it just is kind of this hollow excuse that people can use to kind of put you on your heels and make you be defensive. And so often I've seen Christians kind of fall for that. I've seen, you know, because we, we recognize, man, we aren't perfect. We don't want to make claims of perfection. And, and we recognize that there is hypocrisy in the church sometimes. And so we just kind of, you know, oh yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm so sorry. And we, it kind of makes us, gives us this apologetic version. And yet oftentimes it's people using their own excuses to not follow Jesus and come under his authority. And so they just want us to be defensive and shut up about it. You'll see this because it actually kind of begins to bleed into other parts of life. This isn't just centered on, on re the religious life. One of the reasons is because we're whole people and we live in the world. And, and oftentimes, evangelical Christians, Christians who believe the Bible, um, tend to be politically conservative. Okay, And the, the reason for that is that, that conservative politics tend to better align with the, the teachings of Christianity and the ethics we find in the Bible than progressive ones do. And because we live in, a, in, in polarizing times, you hear a lot of people disparage Christians and they want to claim that Christians are walking in hypocrisy when in fact they're not. In fact, the way that they're walking is not being hypocritical. Something you'll hear if you're at all involved in, in pro-life ministry or advocating for um, the unborn is, is you'll hear something like somebody say, Christians only care about babies when they're in somebody else's womb. But once the baby is born, they don't care about them. The reason they're saying this is because we would say, yeah, we think abortion is wrong and we, we think it should be illegal. And at the same time, then we'd say, oftentimes conservatives would say things like, yeah, I, I don't uh, think that we should keep promoting these welfare programs and you know, universal health care or something like that. And people say, whoa, that's because you only care about a baby when it's in somebody else's womb, but you don't want to help take care of that baby once they're older. You don't care about them. Or they might say about immigration policy, if a, if a, a Christian stands for, um, they say, yeah, the Bible teaches that we should you know, love the foreigner and, and be open to people who are from other places, but we advocate for, for a strong immigration policy or even building a wall to stop illegal immigration. People say something like, the Bible says to love the foreigner and Jesus himself was a refugee. You Christians are such hypocrites. Now, that, that kind of rhetoric is almost always motivated by partisan uh, kind of trying to score points. The, the reason is because very rarely will you find someone who's interested in actually having a conversation about what does Christianity actually teach and are those things not compatible? And if you sit down, sit down with somebody and you could, you could explain to them very easily, I think, that um, you know, uh, being kind to foreigners and loving foreigners does not preclude us from having a strong border policy. In fact, it's just wanting to know who's coming into our country and be careful about that doesn't mean that we, we hate brown people, you know? It, uh, in fact, we might have a very open um, uh, uh, welcoming, and, and historically our, our, our country has been very open to immigration. We want immigrants coming. We, we think that's part of the strength of America, but we don't want just unfettered immigration and be able to come over illegally. We want there to be a process, and we want it to be legal. That's straightforward. That's, that's easy. Those things aren't incompatible. Or when it comes to the fight for life. We would say, yeah, we, we think very much. We want to advocate for the, the human rights of the unborn. 
that we want to we we stand up for the, the, the voiceless unborn and say it's wrong for you to violently rip that baby out of the womb and, and end its life. And yet I also don't support these bloated federal welfare programs that don't actually help people. They just keep the boot on poor people's necks. And they, they incentivize people to stay poor. They don't actually help people long term. And, and we believe that the church and that the family and the community is better suited to help alleviate these kinds of problems than, than some kind of big ballooned up federal program. That's actually super compatible. I'm not being incongruous at all to hold both of those views at the same time. And so yet yeah, sometimes people will say, no, 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 you're a hypocrite. And what you know at that point that you're not being sincere and I shouldn't take you serious because you don't actually want to have a discussion about what the merits of Christian ethics are, right? Now, there's another reason too, which is just anecdotally, my experience doesn't match up with that. My experience doesn't match up with the fact that Christians don't care about poor people. They're just some kind of, you know, uh, short-sighted, narrow-minded group of bigoted people who only care about themselves. That hasn't been my experience in life at all. In fact, as I survey my life and the, and the thousands of Christians that I've known, I find people who have been incredibly generous, people who have served the poor and loved immigrants and fed the hungry and clothed the needy and taken in orphans and supported widows and given generously, who spent thousands of hours loving on people who are less fortunate, millions of dollars helping people in other parts of the world, anguish over the lost using their skills, their creativity, their companies in order to concern themselves with other people's needs. I remember several, a couple of years ago, we had several of our home groups in our church throw a big party for a lot of the Syrian immigrants that were coming from, uh, uh, as refugees from the Syrian conflict. And we went to the park over here, Renette Park. And it wasn't Renette Park, it was the one over in El Cajon. Wells Park, thank you. And, and we just had, we just bought all this Middle Eastern food, all this kebab and all this kind of stuff. And we just welcomed all these families, right? Our bus ministry goes out every week and loves on these people and visits them and, and helps them and serves them. Our youth venture centers, I've seen over the years, I've stood shoulder to shoulder with, with conservative, Republican, white, working class people who have spent thousands of hours and thousands of dollars and opened their homes and given cars and, and support and try to get jobs and help people to, to get jobs of people who were a different race than them and different class than them. And look, I just want to tell you the shoe just doesn't fit. And so if somebody from out there tries to tell me that the people that I know and that I've loved and I've worked with are bigoted, uh, uh, narrow-minded people who don't care about other people, I just say, ha, ha, ha. Not true, right? And, and then if I compare that with my friends, and I have lots of friends who are not Christians, who, who would say things like this, and particularly the ones who say things, and I just compare, what is the weight of what you have done with your life and your resources? And how have you loved and helped people? And I compare that to the Christians I know, it's just not even close. I mean, it's like 10X, the amount of, of love and help and serving that of, of particularly of poor people, of downtrodden, of people who need help that I've seen Christians accomplish. And so the idea of saying that the church is full of hypocrites is laughable to me. And I want to say that's not true. You should actually get to know some Christians. As I was, my wife came to church last night. A lot of times she comes on Saturday nights and she kind of critiques me. Um, <laughs> I've had a teacher to be very gentle, you know. Um, but uh, I was, you know, I said, and she said, you yeah, know, it was good. It was, you had some, uh, some good illustrations and there's some things like that. She said, but you know, we do have a lot of hypocrites in the church. And, uh, and, and it's true, right? It, and we know this, right? Because we're here. We, we know that, that it can be very painful when you run into hypocrisy among Christians. We're, we're not devoid of that. And, and especially when hypocrisy is not repented of and it's, not, it's just accepted, sometimes it can be very, very, very painful and can leave people with real rejection and disillusionment. 1800s, there was a young German boy who greatly admired his father. His father was a religious Jewish man. He made sure that his family's life revolved around faithfulness to Judaism. They went to synagogue every week, and, and um, they, they went to, to Jewish school. Then when the boy was a teenager, they had to move to a different German town. And the different, in that other German town, there wasn't a synagogue. In fact, much of the, 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 the religious life in that town centered around uh, Lutheranism, which is the most common denomination in, in Germany. One day, the, the father came home and he announced to the family that they were going to be converting to Lutheranism. The family was stunned and they asked, why? 
And the father explained to him that he was a lawyer, and if he wanted to become a, a royal magistrate, he wanted to become a, a higher position in a judge, that he would have to be, his, it would it'd be better for him to be a Lutheran. And the family was shocked. And the young man's confusion certain to, soon turned to bitterness and a lifelong disdain for religion. That young man was Karl Marx. We know Karl Marx because he wrote the Communist Manifesto. In fact, that, that frustration and disillusionment with religion plagued him for the rest of his life. He famously said that religion was the opiate of the masses. And so he came up, he invented his own secular religion, communism. Today, two billion people live under communist regimes. Untold millions of Christians and people of other faiths have suffered incredibly because of the hostility of communism towards faith. Now, obviously, Karl Marx had all kinds of reasons and could explain his system economically, but it's hard to imagine that that wasn't born out of his own suffering, his own picture that he got from his dad's hypocrisy. You know, when, when people are hypocrites, people get hurt. The Bible says in Proverbs 20.10, differing weights and differing measures, both of them are an abominable to the Lord. What that means is, is when you have different weights and measures. If you're like, go to the marketplace and one of the merchants, especially in the olden days, right? You'd have the, the scales and they weigh out. They say, how much grain do you want? One pound of grain. And they'd put, you know, a pound weight on one side of it and they'd, they'd measure out a pound of, of grain and they sell it to you. But sometimes if you got a, a sneaky merchant, he might hollow out part of that thing or he might take just an ounce off. And it was, it was instead of 16 ounces, it was 15 ounces uh, on the weight, right? But it would say 16 ounces. And, and God says, that's an abomination to the Lord. He doesn't want us to use false standards or different standards for different people. He wants in the church, he wants the church to be a place where we consistently treat people the same. We don't have insiders and outsiders. James 2, 1 through 4 says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit down at the footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Look, when we act like hypocrites and we use different standards for different people and we have insiders and outsiders, God says it's an abomination to him. You know, one of the things I'm really grateful for this church, one of the things that, one of the ways that hypocrisy oftentimes works its way into a church is that you get people who kind of, the church, if we're not careful, can kind of easily become sort of a country club. A club that we belong to that have a lot of other, you know, people like us that are reputable and respectful and, and that kind of place. And you see this actually all the time. One of the really sad commentaries on our culture today is if, if you watch the, the, the rise and increase of um, um, charter schools, it really coincides with a diminishment of churches. So if you look around at just churches that you would have known, there's several of the churches that used to be churches that are now charter schools because charter schools have, been, have been, uh, become very popular, but um, churches are dying off because churches never replaced themselves. They just got older and older and older, and they just became sort of this ensconced country club, and they never got new people in there. And one of the things I'm really grateful to, to Pastor Mark and Dave for, and, and our church in general, is that um, you know, if we're not careful, that could happen here. But one of the things that, that our pastors have done is they've said over the years that as you know, our congregation has gotten older, and when they started off, it was just a bunch of rednecks and, and hippies and you know, whatever. <laughs> you should see these pictures of Mark and Dave back in the day with their mustaches and look like a, some kind of drug cartel from the 80s. And, um, but you know, as we got more respectable than that, right, as we grew and, and grew in influence and whatever, we always said we want this to be a place where kids and children are welcome. And so our, when we built this place, we, we actually sat down and we spent a lot of time making sure that this place was built to be bulletproof. Because we knew, man, kids are going to come and run down and kick the doors and, and they're going to jump. It's, it's like, I remember when I first had kids, okay? And I remember when I had our first kid, I, I looked at my wife and I said, how are we going to keep this place nice? <laughs> and I realized, you're not. You're not going to keep it nice. Your nice things are slowly going to move up in your house so kids can't touch them and then do you realize they can climb and then your nice things just go away because you can't have kids in nice things, okay? And so we built this place that kids can run and jump and if you go over into our, our, our children's building, you'll walk through the hallways, you'll see that we have these, um, these brown tiles and you'll see some of the brown tiles are different than the other tiles, right? 
Because after time, just as a lot of wear, they get broken, and the tile company didn't send us the same tile that we had before, and so they're a little bit off because we have to replace them regularly. But we've just been committed as a church that we're not going to become a country club. We're always going to let this be a place where people are welcome. People can come. People can, can, can be a part of this church. We want to be a hospital where outsiders feel welcome. So, so we don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be people who we, we, we tell the, 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 the wealthy, respectable people, you know, come sit up here and, and have a place of prominence and, and the, the kind of dirty, you know, uh, uh, people who are not as well off, who are not as well put together, that you guys can, you know, sit back there or stand off to the side. We want this to be a place where we love people well. And so we want, as a church, to be able to root out hypocrisy, not only in our church, but in our own personal lives. I want to share with you guys three ways this, evening, this morning that we can root out hypocrisy. Three ways that we can fight hypocrisy in our own lives. And the first one is this, and this one I think is important. The first one is worry about yourself. Worry about yourself. Hypocrisy is one of those things that's easy to see in other people and hard to see in yourself. And one of the reasons is because we judge other people by their actions and judge ourselves by our motives, right? We, we think that, that we can, you know, to, to, to call someone else a hypocrite, you almost certainly have to have some idea what's going on, you know, reading their mind, right? And, and if, we, if we're so focused on other people's sin and other people's hypocrisy, we're going to miss something that's really easy. You can't actually read other people's minds. You know whose mind you can read? Your own, right? Because you live there, right? That's your thoughts. It's, you can take responsibility for it. And so understanding that, man, take responsibility for yourself. This is what Jesus said. Why do you, in Matthew 7, 3 and 5, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't use other people's sin as a cover for your own. Take responsibility for, your, for yourself. Honestly, examine your own motives. Honestly, examine your own life. You know, you know if, if think about, Lord, is there some way that I am in danger of walking hypocrisy. Be circumspect in your own self-evaluation. Be on guard against the ways that you can fall in hypocrisy rather than concern yourself with other people. So number one, just worry about yourself. The second thing is this, is commit yourself to God's standard or commit yourself to obey God. This is where we're fighting against that, that first kind of hypocrisy, the double-minded hypocrisy where we just reject God's standards and we say we have faith, but we don't live the way that he's called us to. James 1, through 25 says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. The one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. This is important. This is the kind of sin that all of us are in danger of in a specific kind of way. And, and here's, here's why. Because it's easy to become a creature of habit. And as Christians, if we're regularly committing ourselves to going to church, uh, we, it's easy to fall into patterns. Now, I don't know if you have realized the pattern here, but here's our pattern for second service. We start exactly at 1045, okay? Many of you guys start like around 1050, 1055. <laughs> second service is the latest of the services, just so you know. Uh, we start right at 1045. So every week, we're gonna start at 1045. We're gonna have 20, 25 minutes of worship. This morning, I think we had about 27 minutes of worship, okay? Then we're gonna have a prayer. We're gonna have announcements. Then we're gonna have uh, the ear beating that you're getting right now, okay? The, the pastor's gonna come out and preach. This is what's gonna happen next week. It's gonna happen the week after that. And then we're gonna have a time of ministry and we're gonna end in worship, okay? That's gonna happen every week. And if you're not careful, it's easy just to fall in that pattern, okay? Set the alarm clock. I go, show up to church. I know what's gonna happen. I just, and and what's, what can sneak in there is a certain sort of just duty. A certain sort of just, I know I'm gonna go and I'll be here. And if you're not careful, to take what it is that you're hearing and become a doer of the word, then, then what it says here is you're actually in danger of deluding yourself. You're actually in danger of being self-deceived. 
and falling into this pattern. So listen, if, if you are here this morning and you have not up to this point begin to just kind of ask yourself, man, is, is there a way that I could be falling into hypocrisy? Or God, are you speaking to me? Or you're not coming to church with the expectation of, Lord, I want to hear from you, God. I want to grow. I want to learn. Then, then you are in danger of just being a hearer of the word. But if you come with the attitude of, God, I want to receive from you. I want to grow in your image. Lord, would you sanctify me? God, this morning, I want to be soft to you. Lord, would you work on me? And you take it out and you say, man, how can I go apply that in my life? How can I walk that out this week? The Bible says that you become an effectual doer. And it says that, that whatever that man does, he will be blessed. You'll be blessed in all that you do. And so we have to commit ourselves to obeying and following God. And the third and final one, let me invite the band out here. The third and final one is, is maybe the most important, and that's develop a secret life with God. Secrets oftentimes are not good, but secrets with God are good. You know, especially when you find yourself trying to impress other people, and all of us know what that is. All of us have those motives inside of us. We're complicated human beings, and so we have mixed motives. And so sometimes we just, Lord, I want to honor you and worship you. And then sometimes also uh, we want to be seen, right? I've told you guys before, as a junior high pastor, it's the best because junior hires are terrible at knowing this about themselves. Like they're so unself aware. And so they'll do things like this, like the. And they're like high fiving each other and like, look at me, dude, I'm seriously worshiping right now. You know, it's like, oh no. But we all know it. We've all experienced that. We all know what that feeling is, right? I remember the first time that I felt like I wanted to raise my hands in worship, and I was like, I didn't know how to do it. I was like, come from like a Presbyterian denomination. We didn't do that kind of stuff. I was like, everybody's looking at me. I'm doing it wrong. That was embarrassing. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> you know, like, like we all have those little insecurities or like we think that we're the star of the show or whatever it is. But when you have a, a, a when, you, when you set that aside and you say, God, I want to have a secret life with you. Like it says in, in Matthew 6, starting verse 5, it says, when you pray, you're not only, you're not, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. But truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says, don't pray these, these prayers to be seen and acknowledged by people, but pray, have a, have a secret life with God where you're going into your inner room and you're praying in secret and the God who sees in secret will reward you openly. So Jesus goes on to say, he says, when you fast, don't, don't make yourself look sad and emaciated, you know, oh, I'm down two belt loops because I've been fasting a lot, you know? Oh, I just wish I could eat. You go, oh, no, no, you guys enjoy it. I just, I'm fasting, you know? <laughs> he, says, he says, don't do that. He actually says, wash your face, make yourself look good. Make your countenance rejoiceful. When you go out and, and people say, hey, how's it going? You say, I'm doing wonderful. And, and fast in secret so that your, your God who sees in secret will reward you. And then he says, he says, when you give, God wants us to give generously. But he says, he knows because he knows in our heart that we also have this thing in us to be like, yeah, I, church said that. They hadn't seen a check that big in quite some time, you know? He, he says, listen, he says, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Just take it away and, and, and cultivate a secret life with God. Because what you do when you, when you cultivate a secret life with God is you are starving that part of you that wants to get credit. You are suffocating, you're choking it out, that part that wants to be seen and acknowledged and received, and you're just opening yourself up to actually something much deeper, much more fruitful, which is a secret hidden life with God. And it begins to cultivate your character and your personality you begin to be changed in the image of God. You know, one of the evidences for the, the validity of Jesus and the validity of the gospel is changed lives. And it should be when people look at the church and if they look honestly, and I think this is true oftentimes actually already, that oftentimes when they look at the church, what they'll see is they'll see a people who has been transformed. They'll see people who love each other well. They'll see people who are quick to serve, quick to humble themselves. And, and, and look, we're not there, right? We're not perfect, but we want to get there. That's our standard. We want it when people look at our lives, they say, man, I think this Jesus thing, there might be more to it. 
I'm actually, I'm actually kind of compelled that, that maybe the gospel's real. Maybe God really is real. Maybe he does love me. And the reason I think that is because I've seen these people. They're different. Their lives are different. They've they've been transformed. I remember how they used to be. They're not that way anymore. Because God wants, the the Bible says, let your good deeds so shine before men that they may see, let let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That God receives glory and honor when we honor him with the way we live our lives. Would you stand to your feet?